Singularity. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular podcast feature of Singularity Weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. Before we begin our show today, I would like to invite our viewers who enjoy this show to consider supporting it in one of two ways. Number one, perhaps you guys can find a minute to go and post a quick review on iTunes uh, for Singularity One-on-One, which would help me immensely in spreading the word about the the issues, uh, the opportunities, as well as the dangers related to the technological singularity. And, of course, the alternative way of supporting is uh, just simply go to the donations page on singularityweblog.com and um, consider that any funds that you might be willing to uh, provide us are going to be used for the improvement and for making this uh, podcast just bigger and better. So um, with that out of the way, let me welcome our guest today, James Harvey. Welcome to Singularity One-on-One. Thank you, Nicola, and uh, it's always good to talk to you, Socrates. Yeah, James, uh, it's been probably well over two years now um, since our first interview. So for those uh, of our listeners who haven't heard the first one, let me make a little uh, admission here by saying that, uh, or confession rather, by saying that uh, James Harvey was actually my very first uh, interviewee on this podcast and therefore um, he bears probably 50% of the responsibility for the beginning of it because I do not know if I would have had the courage to continue uh, doing it uh, had he declined my invitation uh, to speak online. (laughs) Um, But um, in addition to that, uh, James Harvey is also... um, the author of a very interesting book called Singularia, Being at an Edge of Time. Um, He's a very different person uh, or very unique. He has a unique point of view as opposed to most of my other traditional guests um, on this show because he's not a scientist, but rather he's a musician. Um, However, he's a musician who is, as you would find out soon, is very well versed both in Eastern and Western philosophy, as well as the scientific method and cosmology and so on. So he would fit right in uh, this show uh, without any problem. And uh, so let me begin uh, with the first question here, James. Um, I don't want to repeat all the the interaction that we had uh, during our first interview because I would like to invite our viewers and listeners to to go and hear it for themselves. Um, So let me ask you this. Um, You are known to have criticized um, the concept or the Kurzweilian concept of the technological singularity as a very low resolution as opposed to our own real analog um, universe. Would you, mm-hmm. like, would you mind elaborating a little more on that? Sure, I'd be happy to try and do that. Um, look, it seems very simple to me that um, we live in an analog world, a world of waves and vibrations that has infinite resolution. Science has shown us that. It has proven it to us. No matter how deeply we delve into our perceived material reality or how far out we look into the cosmos, um, we just find more and more and more, and it gets more and more. I mean, it's all come networked and come together, and it's an amazing web, this thing that we know of as life and consciousness. Now, in the thrust of human evolution, which is very brief on this planet, we have come a long ways very quickly and now created a situation where we are digitizing not only information, but pretty much our entire culture. And that's at a very low resolution compared to the analog world, to the world of wind and stars and sky, water and soil and food. So, um, 
mind not so much criticizing as saying, hang on, guys, I know you're really excited about all this, and I think it's going to be really a beautiful endeavor if we can control our instinct to make it the one and only thing. Um, digital technology and the dig digital revolution is actually just another tool, and it's augmenting the amazing consciousness that each and every one of us presents. And that's the, nat the notion of singularia, that each one of us is like a universe unto ourselves neurologically. We're like our own galaxies, and that we can interact with each other is a miracle in itself. That we now have technology where we can expand that exponentially, bravo, all for it. But let's not try and say we're going to download our consciousness into a machine, because I don't know what that would be like, and I certainly wouldn't volunteer to do it first. And I'd like to know who I would ever talk to inside the machine to get an upgrade. Um, <clears throat> the and whole I thing. Think, I think, James, your concern goes even deeper than that by saying that you're not sure if such an upload would be able to capture all the full resolution of your personal consciousness. Just like, for example, and correct mm. me if I'm wrong, mm. but just like one very clear, uh, obvious example is the difference between live musical performance of, say, a beautiful full symphony orchestra and yes. a low bit, say, 128-bit uh, MP3 recording of the same. I mean, the difference of quality and the depth and, and, and the, the spectrum of sound that comes to you is, is just incomparable, almost. There is no comparison. The, an, a, an MP3 file is kind of like a hallucination. You're only given... <laughs> You're only given enough information that your nervous system and uh, consciousness put it together into a semblance, a simulacrum of what was there. But to go to a live concert and hear any piece of music played is an unrepeatable experience. It is its own singularity. You will not have the same musicians in the same relationships in the same time, in the same space, with the same conductor, doing a performance of something that was notated and brought to us out of the past. I was always dumbfounded as a musician when I played Bach. And Bach is such the ultimate master of harmony and music and counterpoint. It was like it all came alive again in the present when we played it. And it was its own singularity. So no, you can't compare it at all. And you can play that piece, the same, the same piece, night after night after night, and it won't be exactly the same. The notes can all be the same. All of that can be the same, but it won't be the same. And I think that's the kind of beauty that we need to start remembering and the kind of awe that we need to start cultivating uh, once again in our lives to balance out this exponential growth in technology. I'm not, a, I'm not saying we, we're not going to have it. We are having it. We're in it right at the moment. But we need to remember that there is balance, and we need to seek that balance, and it's a lot of fun to find that balance. So, so do you think that, in a way, the, the MP3 is a sort of a, an impoverished uh, shadow of the, the original music, uh, as it were, and likewise, by extension, the any potential mind loads yeah. or the digital representation of our, as you beautifully put it, infinitely uh, rich uh, universe, both uh, going down, zooming in, or zooming out, um, would be a, in, it would be a poor representation of that too. Well, all right. Let me just preface what I'm going to say by saying our language tends to trap us into a polarization of dichotomies, good and bad, right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying an MP3 file is bad or wrong. It's a, it's its own miracle in itself. It's an incredible little invention that we can share um, music in that way. Now, if you only know the MP3 file, um, it sounds fine. You won't have a criticism with it. If you are a musician and you play an acoustical instrument, you will notice, or I notice, I'll speak for myself, I notice there's a coldness to the digital sound. It's edgy. It's, it's limited. It's 20,000 to 20 cycles. It, it, it's not like the full overtone spectrum you get in a room with an instrument. So 
I can hear the difference because I have my own experience. Someone who hasn't had experience, they're going to be perfectly happy with that MP3 file. And, you know, God bless them because I want them to have it. I want them to have that music. I think music is one of the prime communicators in our uh, communication with each other. So I'm not against the MP3, but I want people to understand what it is that they're doing. And also what they're doing when they put those buds in their ears. I'd rather you use headphones than buds because that direct line to your nervous system um, is hardwiring kids for sure. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if I get it right, uh, actually this very much reminds me to the very first uh, guest blog post uh, on Singularity Weblog, which was written by you and which was called Singularia, a both end point of view of the singularity. So right. in, other, uh, in other words, you're saying, if I get it right, the MP3 both impoverishes and enriches us, depending on the context. I, I'll throw out the word impoverished. The, the MP3 file enriches us overall. Okay. However, we must not be confused that it's the real deal. I see, I see. If you only listen to MP3s, you are denying yourself an opportunity of an experience that is truly um, life-changing. If you attend, I have been to concerts that have changed my life. I can say that without equivocation. I have heard music that has overwhelmed me, and I walked out of that place a different person than I came in. Can I explain that? No, but I know it's true. I also know that recently I had the opportunity to do the experiment with my own in my own family with my teen years. I have a 15, a 14, and a 13-year-old, two girls and a boy in the middle. They love their computers. They love their iPods. They are totally into the thing, and we work together on it, and uh, it's, a, it's a real interesting trip to have with them. I borrowed a f record player, an old phonograph LP player from a friend to digitize some albums that I had because I wanted to archive them. And in the process, was able to play an A and B test for the kids individually and then together the vinyl and the MP3. And they heard the difference in a blind test. And they went, wow, what's the difference? And I said, well, what do you hear? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know what I'm exactly hearing, but it, it seems warmer was the general consensus. It was a warmer sound coming off the vinyl in an analog situation over speakers versus the uh, MP3 file coming out of the same speakers. They could hear the difference. Now, not everyone would hear that difference, um, but we had that, and now they are looking at it differently. And there was a vinyl f uh, uh, shop opened up at one of the halls recently over a festival that we had here. People flocked to it. People were buying that vinyl. There's a lot of people that understand that now. So, yes, it's a yes and situation. Um, there are wonderful tools, but let's not think it's the one and only. And let's not believe that it's the only way humanity can actually progress into the future. I, I'm not buying that one. And I'm certainly not buying that you can um, make a analog <laughs> measure of human consciousness. Human consciousness is way beyond that. So, so before we get to, 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 to getting a full measure of the human consciousness, uh, let me see. Do you think that with the advance of science and technology, eventually we would be able to capture the experience of a symphony orchestra completely or fully? I mean, perhaps even today that's totally possible. We can create some super high quality, high resolution recording with a 3D hologram, etc., which would be, if not the perfect representation of the original experience, perhaps a very close second to it? Look, we, we, can, we can keep improving that, but I don't think you ever get to the real experience. This is my opinion. Uh, I subscribe to an audio uh, play, uh, thing online that has high-resolution digital audio downloads for audio files. They take up a lot of room. They take a lot of time to download. They do sound uh, somewhat better, but they're still digital. They still have that cold edge that I perceive in digital sound. Um, and it's just what it is. I can still put on that. And, and, and uh, when music acts upon our consciousness. Music isn't a thing, just like a word is not a thing. The word chair is not a chair. 
a recording of Mahler's Fifth is not Mahler's Fifth being performed for you live. It, 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 you just can't compare them to apples and oranges at best. So uh, let me ask you this then. Uh, well, per before we get there, perhaps I will just ask you to begin by saying a few words, maybe three or four minutes about your book, Singularia, uh, for the benefit of those uh, listeners who didn't hear the first interview. Hmm. Um, well, Singularia is um, a big idea that uh, I needed to get off my chest, and I just started writing one day thinking I'd see what happened, and it turned out to be a book. It's actually a meditation. It's a meditation and a thought experiment on who are we, where have we come from, and where are we going? Because I was looking back upon my life, which has been a wonderful adventure and a, an artistic uh, endeavor, um, and very happy with it, but I was looking at my children and going, what kind of world are we leaving them? You know, have we had some sort of failure of nerve that uh, we haven't really delivered upon making it a better world than we found it. And so I had begun writing, and uh, I began with the singularity, the technological singularity, because it was the thing that seemed to be a real catalyst and real strong mem for uh, where are we going. It's, it's the new myth that we're talking, to ourse talking ourselves into. And took it upon myself to analyze that and then compare it to uh, other ways of looking at the world um, that are more alchemical or pragmatic or um, even shamanic and introducing my own experiences uh, here in Australia with Aboriginal people and poetry and other things and mostly it was my message in a bottle to the future. I, I wanted to, to write this all down so that someday maybe my kids when they're my age would pick it up and go oh yeah this makes sense this is what, what was you know, this is kind of what was going on then uh, or to my grandchildren um, but as I had wrote it and people looked at it and they said, this is valuable, you need to put it out. So I self-published it and put it out. And uh, mostly I find I'm preaching to the choir, <laughs> people who already have a bit of concern and wondering what's really going on and really appreciate the main message in the book is the singularity is a fact. However, it is not only the technological side. The technological singularity, in my opinion, is the tip of the iceberg of a much larger cultural and consciousness evolutionary sweep that humanity has been participating in right from the beginning. And it is a crunch point where we are going through the eye, eye of the needle together and we're doing that faster and faster and faster every hour of every day now. And we have to, to, to uh, be able to, to understand that is to be able to uh, actually begin to deal with it on a personal level of not freaking out as these things do happen. Because there's a whole lot of people that don't want to know what's going on with the, with the technological singularity. It scares them. You can see it in our movies. Yeah. We've got The Matrix, we've got uh, The Terminator, we've got iRobot, we can just go on and on. Uh, it, the, the dangers of it, the totalitarian nature of it is certainly rampant, and people are afraid of that now with the Internet being driven more and more to commercialization and advertising, where it's starting to, the computers are starting to tell us through the servers what it is they think we want to know. Well, sorry, I know what I want to know when I know I want to know it. And I don't need a machine telling me. So it's a, it's a frightening thing for many people. And I'm trying to say, oh, don't be afraid of this, but look at it from a bigger perspective. Look at it from a cultural perspective. And there's a lot of material in there that's about uh, the development of human culture right from Paleolithic times. It's a very broad, broad, broad ranging book, um, as you know, from having just taken it in. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I remember actually one point where you were saying there that uh, the singularity is a whole lot more than just technology. Mm. Uh, uh, but, but let me uh, focus a little bit more on, on your criticisms. Um, I think uh, in the beginning, especially in the first uh, two or three chapters, um, you kind of perhaps counterposed uh, what you called technologists and scientists and on the one hand, and artists on the other hand. And you spoke about a Faustian deal. Uh, would you mind explaining that a little bit more? 
that the, the, uh, the technological singularity, digital technology is a Faustian deal. Yeah. Yeah, well, you make a deal with the devil for all the riches of the world in exchange for your soul is the, is the story of Faust. Um, and then when it happens, Faust tries to get out of the deal in the end, as I remember the story. Yeah. Um, and it is that way. I mean, we've put our entire culture online now. Uh, from government documents to messages of love. And uh, it's all dependent upon electricity, which is dependent upon energy. If the electricity goes, we're like Atlantis. <laughs> we're a mythical culture that could do all these extraordinary things, but you can't see it anymore. And, we, and I, I'm doing a big clean out of our house right now, and I was in, in looking through all kinds of past things I'd archive. I have six different tape formats right now in storage, and five of them I don't have machines or know where I'd find the machines to play the beta tapes and all the rest of them. I'd have to go hunting to find an active machine to use it. So I've got media. I've got stuff that's quite precious to me, but I'll probably never see it again, and that's the story of digital technology. If the machine breaks, if the electricity goes out, if the Internet connection breaks down, I mean, we're doing this in audio because we're ha I'm having problems on this end because a tree grew up and my wireless isn't working as well as it should to give video two ways. So we're doing an audio interview. Bit of a disappointment, but we'll turn that into a, uh, a benefit if we can. Um, we can't depend on digital technology as well as we can depend upon the earth. And what about the argument? Uh, I mean, by the way, I entirely accept your... <laughs> Uh, your recognition of the limits of, of, of our current technology and, and the very fact that uh, this is our second attempt to do this interview because the first one failed miserably uh, due to technical difficulties as a result of a tree that grew up in the way of your antenna or something like that. But, yeah. but what about the, 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 the claim that you know as technology gets better and better, uh, uh, or as, as progress goes on, technology gets not only better and more efficient, but also cheaper. So, say, give it another five years, uh, hopefully you would be replacing your antenna with an antenna which is many times better than the one that you have right now, which wouldn't be easily influenced by weather conditions or trees or anything like that, and perhaps at a price which would be either equal or most likely substantially lower than the one that you, you paid for the first one. Hey, that's, that's already the case. When I talked to my internet provider, they said, oh, well, you know, your antenna now is eight years old since we put it up there. There's a new one that supersedes it that has a broader band on it. Pay us 250 bucks, and we'll come out and set it up for you, and I think you'll go better. But you need to go on to a higher pan plan and pay $20 more a month, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, there's technological fixes, and things will improve, and they'll get more complicated, um, and that's fine with me. It can do that, but again, I'm saying this is not reality. This is just our tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the ideas that really uh, struck me uh, in our first interview, which I kind of took away from it, was the fact that you said, I respect science and think it is a marvelous tool but I do not worship it. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, so would you like to elaborate on, uh, on that, or, or is it... Uh, well, look, that's kind of a smart-ass comment that I, <laughs> I laid out there. I'm kind of famous for doing that because I, uh, I try and have a certain kind of humor about these things, but, um, yeah, but it's an ironic certain sense of humor. Anyway, <sighs> what I'm trying to say is... Um, we have made a religion out of another, a number of isms in our current, um, in, in the last 50 years or so. And part of that is technology. But it's also about the money, and it's also about uh, just beliefs like terrorism. Uh, the very abstract things to be trying to nail down, make to be facts. And they become religions for certain people, and their t entire focus... And I'm saying, well, look, I'm not participating in those kinds of belief systems. 
my belief systems run much more to my own personal experience and the experience of others and my family and my community and how we can grow and thrive together. Uh, and that can include digital technology. I won't exclude it, but it's not the only thing. I make sure that our kids get off the TV screen and don't spend hours and hours and hours and hours a day because I don't really want their growing brains to get programmed that way. They will, and they are just as full and wonderful of people as you can find. So they're not going to be uh, hurt by that. And I don't believe that if you don't, haven't got a, an iPhone that you're not going to make it in this world. It's just a gadget. And, you know, as uh, I can't think of the guy's name now, but uh, the book that came out a couple years ago, You Are Not Your Gadget. You're, you're not, not the gadget. Uh, Jaron you're Lanier. Not, yeah. Yes, yes. I like yeah. him. He's a musician. <laughs> yeah, I interviewed him too, uh, actually, for Singularity One on One. And uh, his major criticism is that, in his opinion, uh, without any doubt, starting with uh, Alan Turing, Singularity is basically religion for geeks. Okay, yeah, I can, get, I can dig that. Where, you know, and, and he, he has a, a particular uh, video of, of his presentation where he talks about how, you know, uh, Alan Turing was, you know, homosexual, and how that was at a time when uh, homosexuality was not accepted, but was uh, criminalized in the United Kingdom, especially, and and how he was struggling with with himself, and how the, he, later on he was given female hormones to to sort of sterilize him, and mm. he grew breasts. Uh, um, and, you know, how he tried to uh, replace the sort of Adam and Eve story in the Bible with this idea about artificial intelligence where you go beyond the limits of the body and you sort of, that way you sort of forego the original sin concept and because you, you start having this intelligence which is disembodied, which is non-biological. And basically, mm. he builds up the whole idea of the singularity as, an, as a religion from Alan Turing onwards. Uh, interesting it's, it's very interesting, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I personally don't agree with him, even though he says a lot of interesting things. I don't agree with him on that one, but, but uh, I certainly read his book and enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, well, look, he, he's like any of us. He has really good ideas. And he's got a lot of stuff that fills in the gaps. And you got to take the best and leave the rest with any of us. With it, with Ray Kurzweil. You know, Ray said a lot of things, and a lot of it's forgotten. <laughs> he's made predictions that haven't come true, and he's made some that have. But, you know, M Moore's Law or whatever is not the end of, uh, of, of the story. Um, so, yeah, we're not a gadget. Uh, we're human beings, we're flesh and blood, and I think we should rejoice in that. And if we're talking about it as a religious and a spiritual thing, um, I think part of what drives it as well, and I see that with the technological singularity as Ray Kurzweil talks about it, um, it's a fear of death. It's, it's trying to avoid death. It's trying to become somehow immortal. Or in Ray's case, he wants to bring his father back. Uh, as I'm told, I, I don't know how he expects to do that, but he's gone on record as saying that. So it's a metaphysical thing that, that is, is driving this. And our materialistic point of view that everything is material and that there is no such thing as the etheric or the spiritual is part of the making of a religion and technology would, would be what I would offer to this debate. So, so let me grab that, that uh, thought here about death and, and its importance about, uh, you know, I think it was Nietzsche who said that uh, all arts and science stems from men's attempts or futile attempts, perhaps, to come to terms with his own or her own mortality. Um, and, and, of course, the, according to that logic, the singularity would not be, um, you know, different, but, but also no. music but also music. Uh, Mozart, perhaps, is, is just another uh, parallel or similar attempt to, to defeat death and accomplish immortality. Well, that was Nietzsche you were quoting, right? Yes. Yeah, well, he was a bit depressive. Um, he talks about it as, as relating to death, creativity relating to death. And, okay, that's been an old argument, but creativity is really related to communication. Well, it's Freud, the, Freud argues it's all sex. Nietzsche argues it's all death. And I'm saying it's our desire to, to touch each other and communicate with each other. And through music, I can touch you at a distance. 
I can even touch you over time and space if I record that music. I can ignite an inspiration in your spirit by listening to my blues or whatever it is that I have been able to deliver to you. And as an artist and a person who has worked with many other artists, I know that's our main focus is, wow, how do we get this, this feeling out of us and into the world? That's the basic feeling. Now, it's become commercialized and everyone has to think, and how am I going to make money out of it? Uh, but um, that's a current problem. But really, the creative impulse is to communicate, and I feel that firmly. That's my experience. That's why I wrote Singularia. It was to communicate. I didn't think it was a particularly good idea. I didn't particularly want to write a book. I had other things I needed to be doing. But once I started writing and I got into that creative flow, I entered into a state of grace that was beautiful. It was a beautiful experience. I really look forward to continuing that writing because once I tapped that well, that spring of energy, it started to flow and away we went. And as I say early on in the book, I am communicating to your head while, while speaking to your heart. I really want to speak to people's hearts and to their feelings and to their, their, their notion of who they are and say, don't be afraid, transform. And death is just a transformation. We shouldn't be afraid of death. Death is a natural psyche. You see it in the natural world. Things are born, they grow and develop, they decay and they die, and, and then the cycle returns again. I'm not particularly attached to this particular personality. If this personality goes away, fine. I want to leave the world a better place, though, for having been here. So, and my way of doing it is leaving it with my music and my writing and my, my interactions with people, I think, are, are some of the most strong things. Just the, the interaction you can have with someone, whether it's, it's with love or with, it's with competition, um, say a lot about who you are and also the experience you have and therefore what comes to you, what you actually attract to you uh, as a result of the attitude that you take. And my attitude, our attitude, is the one thing that we can control on ourselves every day and every moment of the day. What attitude am I bringing to this? Um, I, so I, I don't want to sound preachy, but <laughs> this, this is where it's kind of gone. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to come back to the idea of death here uh, and dig in a little bit deeper in it. But, but before sure. that, I want to say this kind of uh, line of reasoning that you're taking reminds me very much of uh, Alan Watts uh, in one of his mm -hmm. uh, recorded lectures where he says that, you know, meditation, the only other activity uh, similar to or two, the only other two activities which are similar to meditation are perhaps music and dance in the sense that um, they're not, uh, they're the end is not the point. It's the journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, therefore, uh, the best uh, musician is not the one who plays the fastest and who no. gets in the fastest way possible to the end. And, and, and the, 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 the point of, of dancing is not getting from point A to point B on the floor. But, but simply being there and doing that activity and, and embracing it to, to its fullest um, and sort of uh, becoming one with it. And, and if I get it right, uh, you're saying that uh, the digital world doesn't have that dimension, that, that depth, because everything becomes a tool, basically, to get from point A to point B, and the journey is lost. I, I think that's a very good observation, Socrates. I hadn't quite put it together that way myself just yet, but as I listen to you, I go, yeah, it's, it's really true. And Alan has a real point. Alan Watts was a, an amazing philosopher. Um, he, he really understood the nature of the Tao, of the ancient Chinese notion that, it all need, that we are seeking balance. Water seeks balance. Earth seeks balance. The weather is constantly seeking balance. It never stops. It's constantly in change. And so the digital world is constantly in change, but it's on a, a driven kind of uh, curve that um, it's still new. You know, we can still make it much more friendly than we want to, but it's, it's being driven by commercial and, in many respects, militaristic desires to have machines do certain things in certain ways, and so then that's what they will do. But, but keeping things in balance can also work in support of the idea of digitalizing or, or the technological singularity. That's uh, right. 
Because you know what? It's our child. Digital technology is our baby. We made it. Mm -hmm. We created it. We found it on the doorstep and we brought it in into our homes without even thinking about what it really is. And now we need to grow it up with ourselves. And so um, we shouldn't be too hasty about it. It's already going fast enough. But we should really realize this is a product of our imagination. And everything begins in imagination and dream. For thousands of years, people watched birds fly and dreamt of flying. And you know what? We did it. Totally irrational. But we do it. And I watch people fly overhead, 400 people at a time in jetliners, heading off to Asia and America over the skies here in Australia. And it's a miracle. But that's our child, too. But it's a child of our imagination and creativity and cooperation and collaboration. And these are the juicy things of life, working and, with others and making things. And how is the idea of defeating death then different? Because, I mean, at least since the, the scrolls of Gilgamesh, Humanity has struggled to find, you know, a cure for death, if you will. Uh, as Nietzsche put it, all arts and science is a result of man's attempt to come to terms with his own mortality. Uh, and, and perhaps now is the epoch, uh, perhaps this century, if, if what people like Aubrey de Grey and Ray Kurzweil are saying uh, is true, perhaps now for the first time ever, uh, we we are within you know uh, our reach uh, in accomplishing that goal. Just like it took two or three or four or five ten thousand years to to get you know men to fly, perhaps defeating death would be no different. Well, perhaps. However, I think it's a very selfish goal. I think in a world of seven billion people that the elite think that they're going to be able to um, live forever uh, is just a fallacy. They haven't really thought this through. Um, I think living, ha having immortality would actually be a curse. And I will go on record here now on your program and say, I do not want to live forever. I want to live to a ripe old age and die at home with my family around me, but I'm willing to go on because, you know, I... Truly, honestly, sincerely believe it's another great adventure waiting. And I'm happy to make room for someone else to step in and have their life and go through that process and do the same thing. And I'm not going to cling on to some idea that I can live forever as if that's the ultimate goal of human consciousness because I just don't agree with it. Okay, so, so let me see if I can get you here on that idea about the, another great adventure. Uh, what what exactly do you mean by saying another great adventure is awaiting? Do you mean to say that there is a soul that survives the death of the body? Well, okay, now we're into the metaphysics, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> I believe in this one can only speak from one's experience, and one cannot uh, impose their experience on anyone else. In my own experience, I am not my body. I have a body. My body is wonderful. It's strong. It's got a genetic heritage that is amazing and uh, it's beautiful. However, I have had from very early on, my first memories are of dreams that are quite transcendental, of a sound that comes out of a vast plain uh, covered by a sky that is just amazing. And I have been on the search of that sound all my life. I have other subsequent experiences where I know that there is a pervasive, all-encompassing love in the universe because I have experienced it and felt an unconditional love in certain places and times and experiences that I cannot explain and can only go, wow, I'm ready. I'm ready to join with that because that, that is the sweetest thing I have ever experienced. This is my experience. So when I say it's a great adventure, that's what I'm expecting. I'm expecting that when I can, when I can finally let go of this very strong, determined body that loves to live, and the body has a mind of its own in its own way, uh, that it wants to live uh, in spite of anything. And I think that's what then becomes the idea, oh, we want to live forever. But that's the body's wisdom. But there's, there's other wisdoms within our body. 
And frankly, one of the part of the technological uh, developments I've been following recently is the is the whole uh, information that's coming out about the heart, and that the heart actually has brain cells and neurons. About forty percent of it, I think, is brain neuron cells in its own nervous system, and that really we think with our heart. You know, I take that point of view that. Of thinking from my heart, thinking from my feelings, thinking from my empathic and compassionate relationship with others, and allowing my mind, my memory, my 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 wonderful mind inform that heart, life works a lot better. Hmm. That's very interesting. I personally never heard of that idea that the heart has a uh, neural cells and so on. But uh... I've I've seen some of the stuff coming across and. Uh, you know, like anything you read, you know, you can't verify it firsthand because you're not that scientist and you don't know what ba barrel they're actually pushing. But I have seen it repeated over and over, and if you go look for it, you might find it. Uh -huh. and, 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 I mean, uh, it, it, is, it is for, you know, those reasons that people have called you a poet, a mystic, a seasoned light worker, and a learned observer of life. Um, so so that fits perfectly with, with who you are and... and uh, and what other people perceive you to be. Um, mm. But let me see if I can ask you in a different way here about death still. Um, because you see, in my life, you, you said all of us, we basically speak from our own experience. And my own experience was this. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of experience people have with death. But my very first time when I realized what death was, was I think I was 13, which is still not too young at all. Mm. Um, and perhaps that's about the age when you can really get the, the depth and, and the definity of, of, the, of the deathness, if you will, is actually when my mother had uh, cancer when she was uh, 38 and a half, she wasn't even 39. I mean, she had it for the last five or six or seven years of her life. She went through a number of uh, failed operations, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, you name it, uh, which eventually failed to alleviate her condition, so she passed away. Um, and for me, that was, of course, a very traumatic experience. Mm. Um, and, and, and But clearly for me, even at that time, uh, or maybe because of that occurrence, death was a very negative uh, kind of event. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, in other words, f for me, it's always been that, you know, every time a human being dies, a library burns. I mean, uh, take, <laughs> you, take you, for example. You, you have a, a, an amazing experience, an amazing life experience, uh, uh, from the United States, I mean, we haven't gone in your background at all, but uh, I know you're originally from the United States. I know you you s found yourself going to Australia on what you thought it was a two- or three-week trip, and you ended up spending the rest of your life there. And, mm. and, and, and so all those things that happened to you, I think it would be sad if one day they are just gone. And yes, you would be able to transmit some of them to the next generation, but that would be a mere fraction. That would be just like a low-resolution MP3 recording as compared to the original symphony orchestra. Yes. And, but and that... I would prefer to have the original for as long as possible because it enriches the existence, both mine and others. Even when we disagree with it, we find, we find your point of view or other point of views worth having. Well, sure. Uh, there's no doubt about that. However, that's a very materialistic point of view that uh, when a person dies, it's all lost. I think in an energetic universe that is composed of vibration and uh, it's not lost. It's still there. You know, I, uh, I quote in the back of my book, uh, I quote Marcus Aurelius, <laughs> the great Stoic philosopher, Roman emperor and yeah. amazing general real amazing human being. I tap back into his thoughts to try and bring them forward to talk about our situation and dealing with it. And when I did that, like with playing Bach, I felt a real communion with that spirit that was way beyond the printed word of the thoughts that came down to us. Mm -hmm. But I'm a very sensitive person. And yes, death is painful. But you know, pain is the great teacher. 
We learn through our adversity. We learn through our challenges. We learn through going through these experiences. They are, they are information. So just information just doesn't come in sugar-coated capsules or, or in Walt Disney Technicolor uh, animations. It's, it, our learning is, is also a grind and a struggle, and I think that's fine. I'm not going to try and make that go away because I think we will be lesser than that. I often think of the kid. I often think and talk to the kids about you. Don't want to end up like the people in Wally who live up in space in their lounge <laughs> chairs to float all over the place with food brought to them by robots. Uh, you want to get out and smell the air. Yeah, but but uh, and I entirely agree with you that you know we learn through pain and struggle. But but the same. Uh, but that's an ongoing process. And the same thing could be said that you know everything that we've accomplished as a civilization or as humanity has been done through pain and struggle. And, and therefore, the the pain and struggle of us coming to terms with our own technology is only part of the process of us learning and getting better and moving forward and upward or outward out of the planet. Um, yes, yes, but you got caught in the dichotomy again. You're saying we, we only learn through pain and struggle. No, we learn through love. Yeah, yeah We yeah, learn yeah. through creativity. We, we, we learn through happy accidents. <laughs> I've learned a lot of things through happy accidents, especially with technology. Um, we learn through workarounds when the technology doesn't work. There's lots of ways that we learn. It's not just through pain and suffering, but to eliminate that part and say that's bad in that dichotomy, I think that's when you get on a slippery slope where you're not really um, thinking clearly. Yeah. And it's a cultural hallucination. It's part of the ocean that we swim in is this whole notion that everything's a thing and it's all material and it's all about money. And that's only our current cultural hallucination. And at that point, culture's not your friend. Hmm. Again. Hey, yeah. and by, by the way, when you mentioned Marcus Aurelius, it reminded me very much to uh, a short quote that he said on, on death, which I love. And he said, death smiles at us all. The only thing we can do is smile back. Yeah. Make friends with it. Make friends with it. Look, I was brought up as well as in a strong classical musical tradition along the way. I got thrown into the deep end of the pool in the shamanic tradition. First thing I got taught was, taught was make friends with your death. Make friends with your death. Every time you do something, realize that you may not come back this way again, so do it right. Did that happen with the Aboriginal community in Australia? Uh, it went into uh, <laughs> very, very deep places with the Aboriginal people in Australia, but it happened first in North America, and it happened through a healing crisis, where I had been working way too hard, doing three jobs, had a healing crisis, and coming out of that healing crisis, part of that healing was um, uh, a shamanic experience that needed explanation, and I had to find some people who knew about that business, and when I did, I got healed and my body got better and um, it's very personal it's something I don't talk about a whole lot because no one can understand it it's ununderstandable but it is part of my part of my development and it's one that I honor and respect though it doesn't have a great uh, place to be able to talk about it in our culture right at the moment because it's too wacky and the people who do talk about it talk about it in too wacky a way it's, it's, a, it's a serious science and technology the science of the cycles of the earth and our connection to it and how you focus your attention and therefore your energy because the focus of attention and energy is what will get you to where you're going just like an entrepreneur knows I've got my idea and I'm gonna make that idea happen they're focused they're doing a shamanic act as far as I'm concerned but um, in all of that um, death I would say death is my friend I certainly don't look forward to a difficult death or a painful death. I wouldn't, I don't wish that upon myself. But if that's what happens, that's what happens. That will be a learning as well, I'm sure. I hope that I can manage to have uh, an exit where I'm fully conscious and can leave this domain and go into the next energetic domain with this consciousness of mine and move on um, and see what happens. But I don't make any predictions about that, and I'm certainly not saying that, you know, I'm going to come back and talk to people or anything. I don't want that. <laughs> you can do it yourself. I mean, I, I didn't mind. You can do yours. <laughs> James, that's, that's very, very fascinating. But um, I'm afraid we're actually um, 
advancing towards the the end of our interview because yeah. we've been going for easily over 45 minutes by now mm -hmm. um so uh let me ask you uh the usual uh two questions that i usually ask uh of my guests uh towards the end of the interviews um, and the second last is where can our listeners go and find out more information about you and your work if they want to do so all right. Um, well, the website for Singularia is um, Singularia, S-I-N-G-U-L-A-R-I-A dot com dot A-U. And that tells you about the book and you got some things there and it's all kind of pretty and lots of information. Um, then people can go to YouTube and they can find some YouTube videos I put there. If anyone wants to write to me, they can do so at what if one word w h i t i f dot it is at gmail, and I'm happy to answer questions or talk to people or communicate. Uh, I feel that's my job is to communicate in the most open and heartful and respectful manner. If people want to, you know, diss me or something, well, they can do that on their own time. But um, um, no, I I would love to communicate with people, and people are welcome to come to the web website, and um, that's a place to begin. That's fantastic. And James, I have to admit that um, the idea that I would take away from you today, from this interview, from my point of view, would be the infinite granularity of our analog universe. Both if you zoom in, uh, yeah. we have an infinite granularity, uh, and, and the same pertains to zooming out and, and yeah. how the digital uh, representation of it is not accurate. Uh, but, but uh, or is missing the, the, the full picture, as it were. But from your point of view, if you had a, a single message that you would like our viewers and listeners to take away from you today, what would you like that to be? All right. Well, first of all, let me just say, uh, I really appreciate and thank you very much to, for your, your, your allowing me to come and have a chance to, to talk to your audience, who I know are very smart and dedicated and interesting people. Um, the message I would say is that the technological singularity is only the tip of the iceberg. That this is a large cultural, social, evolutionary change that we're going through. And if you can step back and see it from that point of view a bit more, uh, I think we might all be able to come into a dialogue and a discussion that's a bit more balanced than just a business plan that's driving more uh, digital innovation for the sake of it and for the monetization of it. Uh, we're we're in a uh, we're in a cultural revolution. We're in an evolution of consciousness that's called singularity that I call singularia. That's fantastic. Um, I'd like to take this moment to to thank our listeners who uh, uh, enjoyed perhaps uh, this interview as much as I did. And uh, if that was indeed the case, uh, I just want to remind you. Uh, to, to go and write down uh, an iTunes review for the show if you guys enjoyed the show. And I also want to thank James Harvey for being here with us. Thank you, James. Thank you, Nicola. It's always a pleasure.